Good afternoon and welcome to Lunch and Learn Classic Conversations with the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra, coming to you from the Cottonwood Room of the Laramie County Library. I'm William Trilligator, Music Director and Conductor of the Cheyenne Symphony, and thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, we're going to talk about the concerts that the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra will perform tomorrow, and we'll have a chance to visit with our wonderful guest artists in just a moment. Before we get to them, I'll tell you a little bit about the other two pieces on the program. We're starting with a burst of energy, a piece called Starburst, actually. It's written by American composer Jesse Montgomery, and it was written just about, ooh, I guess, nine years ago. And it was actually originally composed for this elite group of outstanding young classical musicians through the Sphinx organization that helps Black and Latinx uh, young musicians find a place in the classical music world. There was a, a chamber orchestra created of some of their superstars. And they were all African American or Latinx. And writing for that ensemble, Jesse Montgomery thought, these are all stars and their careers are about to burst. And so she named this piece Starburst. But actually, it's, uh, it's actually a real thing in astronomy. <laughs> and uh, I have a quote here from the composer, Ms. Montgomery. And let's see, she writes, oh, one second. Okay. This brief one movement work for string orchestra is a play of imagery of rapidly changing musical colors. Exploding gestures are juxtaposed with gentle fleeting melodies in an attempt to create a multidimensional soundscape. A common definition of a starburst is the rapid formation of large numbers of stars in a galaxy at a rate high enough to alter the structure of the galaxy significantly. And she says that lends itself almost literally to the nature of the performing ensemble that premiered the work, The Sphinx Virtuosi. And I wrote that piece with their dynamic in mind. Take a listen. Concerts, there'll be an extra added dimension to this piece because we'll be projecting the winning art submissions by art students who listen to this music and then were inspired to create original art based on it. And it, we have an annual judge art show called Art and Music, and the winning pieces will be actually projected on the back screen, or I should say the back shell behind the orchestra while we perform it. So that will be really neat too. A little bit more about Miss Montgomery. She's a violinist herself, and she's written some really amazing pieces, and she's had some um, performances with orchestras and other ensembles across the country. You're definitely going to hear a lot more about Jessie Montgomery. She grew up in the, I guess, downtown lower side of Manhattan in the 1980s, and she was trained classically in violin at Juilliard. Um, she got her um, advanced degrees in composition and also, I think, like musical engineering at NYU. Um, she's an educator, composer, violinist, producer. She's been part of the Providence String Quartet, and she's currently in the Catalyst Quartet. Um, her String Quartet, Strong, is a wonderful piece, which I highly encourage you to check out on YouTube. Um, she's been in residence with the Albany Symphony. She's currently writing in L.A. Uh, lots of different things. So she, she's a wonderful composer, um, and I'm excited to feature her for the first time on these Giant Symphony concerts. After Starburst, we're going to get to hear world-class clarinet playing in the 
Franz Kromer could share over two clarinets. But as I often do at these lectures, I want to save the guest artist for the end. So I'm going to skip over that piece and talk about the final piece on the program next. Mozart's Symphony No. 40, one of my all-time favorite pieces. Mozart's Symphony No. 40 is so special and unusual. It is part of a sort of trio of symphonies that Mozart wrote in a very short, concentrated creative outburst in the summer of 1788. In just a few short months, literally like two and a half months, he wrote three, his three final symphonies, symphonies number 39, 40, and 41. And it's also unusual that he wrote them at that time because it wasn't clear whether there was actually a performance opportunity for that. It's almost as if he was trying to test himself. But we know better. Mozart was too busy and too strapped for cash to just spend time writing symphonies that wouldn't produce some kind of monetary income for him. This was the same time when he was writing these desperate, really pathetic letters to his friend and fellow Freemason, Michael Kuchberg, begging for money. This was also a time of difficulty where his wife, Constanza, was ill, and also a time where they lost one of their daughters. Daughter had just passed away, uh, died. You know, infant mortality was such a thing that they, the Mozarts lost several children. But it was a difficult time. And what's amazing is that these symphonies are sort of like the crowning achievement, if you will, of 18th century symphony, of the 18th century symphony. But more than that, the symphony number 40 really looks forward to the 19th century or even the 20th century in a way that I'll explain later. It has an intensity and drama about it that was unparalleled at that time. It's amazing, really. The symphony number 40, the middle of these three last symphonies, the one that we're performing this weekend, is a dark, tragic piece. And it has an intensity about it that was unmatched at that time for any symphony. Remember, this is, oh gosh, 20 years before Beethoven's fifth, um, you know, 15, 17 maybe years before the Eroica. And symphonies at, the, at that time, you know, they were still kind of intended to be entertainment. Although, you know, certainly Haydn was bringing the symphony to new levels. And even Mozart's earlier symphonies brought the symphony to a new level. But the incredible um, passion, intensity, rhythmic uh, and chromatic intensity of this symphony number 40 was unheard of at that time. It's amazing. The symphony exists in two different versions. One version, uh, the original version, which we'll play at the concerts uh, at the Civic Center, has no clarinets. But we know very well that the clarinet was really coming into its own as an instrument at that time. And Mozart was going to write in just a few years his beautiful clarinet concerto for Anton Stadler, wonderful clarinetist and friend of his. There's also the clarinet quintet and other pieces. And so one of the interesting things about this symphony is that if it didn't have a, a performance in Mozart's lifetime, which there is no definite proof that, that there was, why did he create a second version adding clarinets after the fact? Really what he did was he kind of took a lot of the material that he gave to the oboes, gave it to the clarinets, gave the oboes a few other little things. But really it's interesting that there are these two versions of the piece Many people have said that because there are these two versions, it's very likely that he added clarinets for a specific occasion. So we think he did hear this piece performed in his lifetime. But again, there's no proof. There is some evidence that maybe some of these symphonies were conducted by Salieri, nonetheless, in 1791, Mozart's final year. Um, but again, no definite proof. But the ways that it has the emotional and chromatic intensity, make me think of a little bit of this period of art and music known as Sturm und Drang. In the 1760s and 1770s, inspired by Goethe's great work The Sorrows of Young Werther, artists, writers, and composers got inspired to put more passion and storm and stress, as it's called in English, the Sturm und Drang, in their art. It was a brief period. During that period, Mozart, in 1773, wrote his only other symphony in a minor key, the same key, G minor, what we call the little G minor symphony, his symphony number 25. It was an experiment, if you will, in putting that kind of passion and darkness into art. And it was part of a trend in the arts at that time, that 
trend was short-lived. And by the time Mozart wrote Symphony No. 40 in the late 1780s, that was not the fashion. What we have here in Symphony No. 40 is something that's more akin toward the Romantic era, something that would be ushered in in maybe another 15 or 20 years. What's also interesting to remember is that this is the time, 1788, of great turmoil and revolution, political revolution at that time. And, you know, we don't think of Mozart being caught up in the revolutions that were going on in France and other places, as we do maybe with Beethoven. But nevertheless, I think it's hard to separate the artist and the composer from the times that they were living in. The Symphony No. 40 is also special because I think, and this is kind of something that's just my own little pet theory, that with these three symphonies, Mozart created something new, which was a sort of meta-symphony. I believe that he actually intended the three symphonies to be a unit, perhaps to even be performed in order, in one, in one sitting. Now that had never been done before, but maybe it actually inspired a later composer, because many people have noticed that Beethoven's fifth and sixth symphonies were written at the same time. In fact, at one point, the numbers of them were um, alternated. And there are interesting theories as to that Beethoven's fifth is perhaps chapter one, or part one of a big story, whereas the sixth is part two, and that they belong together. I wonder if Beethoven, in studying or hearing maybe Mozart's last three symphonies, was inspired by them. Why do I think that there's a big meta-symphony program with these last three Mozart symphonies? Well, for one thing, let's take the symphony number 39. It starts with an incredible kind of introduction with great pomp and celebration. And it moves through many different kind of characters and emotions, ultimately ending with something very joyous and playful in the final movement. And then it ends in the key of E flat, the home key of that symphony. The beginning of the G minor symphony starts in an ambiguous kind of key. For a moment, we don't know if we're in the key of E flat or B flat or G minor, which we actually are in G minor. Once the violins come in, we hear the key established, but it's almost as if he was making a connection from the previous symphony into this symphony, a kind of bridge, if you will. Also, the second movement of this symphony, number 40, has an early kind of like plant seed planted for the main melody of the final movement of symphony number 41, the Jupiter. A very famous, contrapuntal, brilliant movement. Forgive my singing, that was horrible. <laughs> but you know that theme. It's a very well-established theme, and that's in that movement of Symphony Number 41. In the slow movement of Symphony Number 40, you have an upbeat in the violas at the very beginning. Other violins come in then. So you actually have the outline of the of that theme there in the first four measures of the slow movement of symphony number forty, and that's not the end of the connections between all these three symphonies. So that's an interesting thing. Let's talk for a moment about the key of G minor itself. This was Mozart's favorite key for tragedy and drama. Um, one thinks of some of the really like intense. Um, arias like Amina's aria, um, and of course there's the other G minor symphony. There's um, the G minor. Uh, well, the clar I mentioned the clarinet quintet. I believe it's in G minor. Um, is it? No, no. Sorry, I'm looking at the wonderful clarinets I have in the room. We'll meet in a moment. But it was his favorite tragic key in a sense. And I said there were only two symphonies in minor keys. One of the things that's amazing about the symphony is that. The tragic darkness of that key never lets up. Only a brief moment in the trio of the third movement do we actually get a moment of G major. And it's like this sudden ray of sunlight comes in, and it's over in like a minute and a half. Yes, the slow movement of this isn't a major key. It's an E-flat major, but it's the darkest E-flat major you can imagine, with a lot of ventures into dark keys like A-flat minor. But what's also amazing is that normally in the outer movements of a symphony, if you start something in minor, 
You gradually end in A major. When the second theme comes back in a recapitulation, it's usually in the tonic major. No, in these outer movements, it comes back in a sort of defiant minor G minor. The symphony ends in minor. It might have been the first symphony to do that. Let's play a little bit so you know what I'm talking about. Just keep gushing about this piece. You can tell how much I love it. Um, and there's so much to say about it. Here is the very famous first movement book.
this various with the sadness of life. Like that, 
You're like, oh my gosh, he has every pitch in here except G. And you know that Mozart had that in mind. It wasn't a coincidence. Amazing. So there's the harmonic daring. There's the rhythmic daring. There's the emotional intensity. You know, speaking of the rhythmic daring, I haven't played any part of the third movement, and it's a great example of it. The third movement is all about displacing where the beat is. It's about those hemiolas I was talking about. It's a great word, hemiola. Uh, let's hear a little bit of this here. You'd think that a minuet movement would be about dancing. This would be very difficult to dance. And Mozart is really kind of thumbing his nose in a way at the tradition of minuets and symphonies are really being danceable in a way that's kind of a forerunner of Beethoven. Here's a little bit. <laughs> So as you can tell, this Mozart symphony is very dear to me, and I just 
to keep talking about it on and on and on. But I want to have enough time to visit with our wonderful guest artists. Uh, we're so lucky to be able to perform a piece that's rarely ever heard. But to hear this rare piece in a version that is just world class because of our soloists. So please join me now. Love me are our soloists, Anton Rist and Kellen Tui. Welcome, gentlemen. Hi, right, thank you. I'm going to put my mask on here. First, let me say off the bat, uh, what a pleasure it is making music together with both of you. This has been an incredible treat, and our audiences are in for such an incredible treat with your performing. Let me also say that you're not both guest artists, are you? Anton is a wonderful guest and a now a new musical friend to the symphony, but Kellen is not a guest at all. Kellen is our associate principal clarinet in the Cheyenne Symphony, and I believe you've been in the orchestra for about is it six or eight years? Yes. Yeah, so you already heard Kellen perform many times and admired his playing in many situations within the orchestra, including, by the way, when we featured the Winds and Brass back in November, and Kellen had a beautiful part to play in the Guno Petit Symphony and in the Mendelssohn Nocturne, and he did that so beautifully. So we're very excited to feature one of our own, but we're also excited to get to know Anton. And maybe, Kellen, maybe you could start off by telling us a little bit about how this project started and a little bit of your background uh, as musical friends. Yes, absolutely. So um, maybe I can start off talking about how Anton and I met each other, became friends. Uh, we were students at the Aspen Music Festival about 10 years ago uh, at the same time. Um, met each other, played a lot of music together, went on a lot of hikes together. And since then, we've collaborated many times, um, you know, traveling, musical performances, things of that sort. And so, um, anyway, I obviously had Anton in mind to, uh, to perform this piece with me, because um, I couldn't really think of anyone who would possibly do a better job. <laughs> He's a fantastic uh, person and musician. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we were... How did you find this piece? Or was it always on your radar? Or did you think, I'd love to do a concerto for two clarinets with my friend Anton. What's out there? Or did you think, oh, there's that Kromer piece. Anton and I should do it. Like, what was the order of that? Like, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we were, um, you know, for a long time, we've been looking for more opportunities to work together. And we both knew about this piece that's pretty popular in the clarinet community. <laughs> oh, good. And so, um, yeah, it's just a fun, delightful piece, and so I'm not actually sure which of those came first, knowing the piece or sure. looking for something to play together, but yeah. That's yeah, great. Fun. And before we pass the mic to Anton, just tell us a little bit more about who you are, where you came from, when did you start clarinet, and you know, where you're based now, other groups you play in. Absolutely. So I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and um, I've... I've stayed in Colorado mostly my whole life. Um, I got a, a doctorate from CU recently, and as as William mentioned, I do play with a number of other groups in the region: Fort Collins Symphony, Boulder Chamber Orchestra, and I am uh, fortunate to be able to kind of sub with most of the other groups as well from time to time. That's great. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, let's get to know Anton a little better here too. Thank you for your patience, Anton. Of course. Yeah, welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? And, uh, you know, is this, by the way, your first time in Wyoming? It is my first time in Wyoming. Welcome. I've been to Colorado a lot of times, but sure, first time in Wyoming. So I am uh, from Manhattan originally, where I still live. I seem to have stayed there for my whole life. I went to school <laughs> there. I played in youth orchestras there. I freelanced there for a few years. Um, before winning the job at the Met Opera four years, almost five years ago. Wow. Ever wow. yeah. since. So you are the principal clarinet of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and you have been for five years. You look so young. I mean, was that uh, kind of an upset in clarinet world that somebody so young could win such a prized position in the orchestra world? No, the funny thing about that orchestra, I am not the youngest clarinetist in the history of the orchestra. Really? I think someone started there when they were 20 or 21. Wow. So 
the, the orchestra is used to very young members. I see. Uh, but it was, of course, a huge position to undertake. I was a little bit of these two quickly. You were telling some of the students at um, Central High School yesterday, by the way, both of these wonderful art, musical artists gave their time to visit and inspire the young musicians at Central High School yesterday via Zoom. Thank you for that. You were telling them that uh, when you got the job at the Metropolitan Opera, you had really enjoyed playing in the pits for a few operas when you were a student at Juilliard, but there was, what, how many, you had to suddenly learn so many operas. Tell us a little bit about So that. many operas. So going through school, we are all used to the Beethoven symphonies, the Mozart symphonies, and the Rhymes. So if you start a symphony orchestra, you have a, a good leg up getting ready for your first season. In opera, I had played maybe two of the operas that I had to learn that season, out of a total of about 15 or 16. So there was maybe 40, 45 hours of music that I had never even heard, and styles I didn't know, composure with all that. So did you get the scores and recordings and just like, and follow along with your principal clarinet part, or how did that work? All the time, all the time. I got the scores, every three minutes I'd be listening along trying to, trying to figure out what was going on. Amazing. Do you have some favorite operas? Are there some that really stand out for you? Oh, sure. Uh, so there's sort of several categories. My favorite just musical, beautiful opera, I think it's probably Tosca, which has a very famous clarinet solo. Beautiful. Wow. Probably the most famous, most beautiful clarinet solo I can think of. So that's always beautiful to listen to, to play. All the Puccini operas are simply very, very lush. Um, but as far as actual, just like, enjoyment to play the part, the Strauss operas are really fun because he writes Every part has so many details and so many notes that you're kind of just going crazy for the whole time. Sure. And some of them are also very short, but it takes so much more time compared to those than a four hour opera. Right. And do you have any favorite opera singers, or are there some young up and coming opera singers you work with who we may not know about here in Wyoming that we should be listening for? Oh, sure. So actually, someone that I was in school with and sort of had similar friend circles is now singing at the Met. She's just her name is Golda Schultz, and she's made, she sang Rose and Cavalier with us uh, so last season, and it was, it was stunning. Um, I also really like Peter Matei, mm. he's a baritone, yeah. he's just a beautiful voice, lovely phrase, a lot to sort of, like, sitting in the pit, you're kind of inspired by what's going on on stage, you're trying Fantastic. to match it, emulate it, all of that. Wonderful. Yeah. When you started with the Met, was um, the... Was the music director already uh, Nedzi Sigmund, or what, did he come during these last five years? I'm trying to remember the time frame here. He, so uh, when he started in, I think, 2018 was his first official yeah. season. So maybe you had some overlap. I did have some overlap, yeah. yeah. Oh, first season was still James Bond. Uh-huh, right. Wonderful. Well, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who is Franz Kromer. And either one of you can take this opportunity. Um, because he's a composer not as well known. He's not a household name, but he should be better known, shouldn't he? Yeah, exactly. Um, so he was a Czech composer, but many people consider him an Austrian composer because he lived in Austria for many years of his life. Uh, he was a contemporary Mozart, and uh, he wrote several clarinet concertos, um, two concertos for two clarinets and one concerto. For one clarinet. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think flute concerto, oboe concerto, and there's many others. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah lots of concertos, lots of orchestral works. Um, yeah, but nine symphonies, apparently, and 70 string quartets, apparently. Yeah. Wow. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <you're laughs> <going. laughs> no, please. Um, and this piece that we're playing was, was published right around uh, the turn of the 19th century. So it was after Mozart had already died, and after Mozart's Beloved clarinet concerto had become already pretty well known, and you know I'm sure he was inspired by that piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he, the next year, he wrote a concerto for just one clarinet, and then a few years later, another double concerto. So he had some some clarinetist friends and colleagues who he would compose for. I wish I knew whether it was also that Anton Stadler or not. I don't remember his dates and whether he lived into the 1800s long enough to maybe be the intended performer for some of the Cromer clarinet pieces. I, I have no idea, and it's hard to it's get a question on Cromer. But it's interesting that he started out in a modest kind of position as a violinist in a court orchestra for a small court, and he ended his life as like the court composer for the emperor, 
which was pretty cool. And he was in that position for maybe 25, 30 years or something. So, um, yeah, it's so interesting. I'm sorry if I'm jumping ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was all. Um, so he seemed to have a particular affinity for the wind instruments. And he even has written pieces that are nowadays performed by like collegiate wind ensembles and things of that nature. So he's a real favorite, I think, among the wind players. Um, but he did write all these other kinds of pieces. But I, it's interesting that he himself was not a wind player. He was a violinist and an organist, but he just had a fascination with these instruments. Would you say that his writing for clarinet is idiomatic? Um, for the clarinet? For the most part, I think it, it lies very well. There's a lot of, you know, we call them noodles, <laughs> sort of like these flourishes, these fast runs that lie pretty well in the clarinet. There's nothing that is too awkward or uncomfortable. Um, a few passages, I think, resemble violin string playing, um, sort of like these expanding into a little boy, 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 which are very, seem very natural on um, the strings. But on clarinet, it's a little bit different. Sure. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's just very, very natural. Okay. Yeah, I think One of the things I'm impressed about with this piece is that he really explores the full range of just the, the clarinet's range, but also its expressive possibilities and colors. What, I mean, it's so wonderful that you get to play down low so much in that shallow red shirt, but they also get to play high, and it's just the most amazing thing, really, is the interweaving of the two clarinet parts, isn't it? That's what I love so much is that, you know, this clarinet one and clarinet two in this part, they're both equal. Yeah. You play higher than <laughs> I don't know, you have the highest note. So that there's this constant, like you said, trading back and forth between these lines. Wonderful. Would you be willing to give us a little example of maybe the first movie? Yeah, sure. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I asked you this, and I thought this was interesting. I was like, is it helpful that you, um, is it your instruments or your reeds or your setup that helps you match your sound, or is it more of like your conception of, of, of you know, in your inner ear? Yeah, I think maybe the latter. Um, our instruments are a bit similar, but we actually have none of the same exact equipment. Isn't that um, interesting? But I think we have a similar sort of aesthetic for clarinet playing, and I've always loved, you know, Anton's style of playing. Hopefully he's, he's like mine as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we like a lot of the same kind of approach to clarinet playing. Do you know what I mean? I agree completely, and it's 
there are sometimes you play with people who have to adjust and the other. Oh, all right, I can bring this a pitch a little different, or I can do something different with my sound. With Cal, it's just, you know, first time we sat down together and played through this, it was pretty much there. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't had to go through and do too many things. The other thing I was so impressed with was that, I mean, this has been on the schedule for a long time, but especially with the pandemic, I mean, you're in Boulder, Colorado, and you're in Manhattan, and you are, and tell us about how you rehearsed before you came together in person. So um, we both, I, you know, I practiced the part probably for at least a month before, before coming out here, and uh, maybe two weeks ago we met on Zoom for about an hour, and I think you had to leave somewhere, so it might have been like 45 minutes. We just went through, measured by measure, and decided let's play a crescendo there, let's play a little louder there, a little softer, and just mark the parts that most of the rehearsing was done. So over Zoom, did you actually play together, or did you mostly just talk about it? We didn't try to play together, but we just would demonstrate certain things like, well, we can play like this, or we can articulate that. It's wonderful. I love the thought that you put into it. I mean, it's just gorgeous. You're phrasing, and just the way... The way you blend is just so special. I just can't necessarily find the right words for it. Do you, um, is there anything else about the first movement that you want to point out or mention or before we move on to the second movement? I, I think it's just great to close your eyes and try to imagine who's playing what part and so hearing certain things emerge and hearing the, the two parts interact, I think is kind of the most fun way to, to go about to yeah. these. Yeah, because it, it, it sometimes it's unclear from the audience, like, who's playing what? It's just the pass-offs that are, are so frequent and so beautifully done. So, yeah, that is a fun part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to give us a little demonstration of the slow movement? Sure. Yeah. Quite fun, isn't it? 
It's in that what you might expect a sort of rondo form, um, and it's very playful. What, how would you? What, what else would you like to share about? Very that? playful, very energetic, very easy to rush. <laughs> <laughs> and just play too fast and get too, too caught up in it all. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just a lot of fun. A lot of very well written clarinet things. It is, yeah. I have to say, what's been, what I find fascinating about this movement is that even though Cromer was a violinist really himself. I feel like this is so idiomatic for the clarinet that the, the violins have to work, and it's harder for them. Not to say that it's easy for you at all. I mean, my goodness, you do make it sound easy, but I know it's it's technically challenging. But there's something kind of sometimes awkward about it for the strings, and, and you know, maybe it's just you know playing in flats and sometimes playing down low really fast and things like that. But um, I just think it's fascinating that in a way he almost like favored you guys over his home instrument. <laughs> so we'll play some of the last Sure, please. Thank you very much. questions from you all, or, but, uh, you know, given the virtual format, we won't be able to do that today, but thank you both, bravo, thank, thank you, you. really looking forward to tomorrow. So, so are we? Great. And before we sign off, we'll give a chance for uh, Elizabeth Thorson from the Laramie County Library to tell you a little bit more about what might be coming up here at the library. We want to extend our thanks to the library for their ongoing partnership in these Lunch and Learn Classic Conversations. They're a great partner, and of course, a fantastic uh, resource for our entire community, this library, the beautiful building, the incredible programs, and, and the collection. So please welcome Elizabeth Thorson. We have some exciting new events coming up in March. We have a, our Genealogy Wednesday, which is going to do Irish Genealogy for uh, St. Patrick's Day. We also have a new program called Paint and Sip, which uh, we will provide you with a painting kit. And then one of our staff will walk you through how to create your own painting. 
We also have Jeopardy, which we've done several months, and we're starting a virtual book club. So please check out all of those events on our website. And then in April, we will have our last uh, event of, with the symphony for this year, and it is called... Uh, Fantastic Finales is the name of our April concert, and we'll be featuring um, guest pianist David Korovar performing Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto, and uh, other wonderful pieces we'll be telling you about then. Uh, the Symphony Number no. One by Saint George, and uh, Rossini's wonderful William Tell Literature. <laughs> I can't help smile when I say that. <laughs> it's definitely fun. So don't miss out on that. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon.